and welcome to a very special presentation of a cozy Christmas podcast. I'm your host and narrator, Art, and I will be sharing with you today the first of a four-part story, The Christmas Hirelings, by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Braddon was a prolific Victorian writer with more than 80 novels to her name. Uh, this story I'll be beginning for you today is one of her lesser known works, but one that I think deserves a lot more attention than it's getting. I love A Christmas Carol, and this story fits in nicely with being a part of your yearly Christmas canon. Again, these episodes, the story will be delivered to your podcatcher of choice on Fridays through July of 2021. So just stay subscribed to the podcast and you will get those automatically. Or you can check us out at CozyChristmasPod.com. And that's all I have as far as introduction goes. Let's go ahead and get started on this wonderful, wonderful story. Make yourselves comfortable. Turn up the fireplace or turn down the uh, air conditioner, depending on what side of the world you're on. Close your eyes and imagine... A beautifully lit Christmas tree as we enjoy Mary Elizabeth Braddon's The Christmas Hirelings. Prologue The scene was the library at Penn Lion Place, commonly called for shortness, Place. The personages were Sir John Penn Lion, a great land proprietor, and a gentleman of the early Victorian school. His niece, Miss Adela Hauberk, a smart young lady whose paternal home was in South Kensington, and Mr. Danby, the useful friend whose home was everywhere. Home of his own, Mr. Danby had none. He had drifted lightly on the stream of life for the last 40 years, living in other people's houses and, more or less, at other people's expense. Yet, there lived not the man or woman who would have dared to describe Mr. Danby as a sponge or a toady, as anybody's hanger-on or parasite. Mr. Danby only went where he was wanted, and the graces of his manner and the qualities of his mind and heart were such that Mr. Danby was wanted everywhere. He had invitations three years deep, his engagements were as far in the future as the calculations in the nautical almanac. Some people, who had been trying for years to get Mr. Danby to their houses, compared him to that star whose inhabitants may now be contemplating the Crimean War of 1854. Sir John Penlyon and Mr. Danby had been schoolfellows at Eton and chums at Christ Church, and whomsoever else he disappointed, Mr. Danby never omitted his annual visits to Penlyon Place. He Christmased there, and he Eastered there, and he knew the owner of the fine old Tudor house inside and out, his vices and his virtues, his weaknesses and his prejudices. That there, Danby, said Sir John's valet, can turn the old chap round his finger. But he's a good fellow, is Danby, a gentleman to the marrer, and nobody's any the worse for his influence. The library at Penlyon was one of those rooms in which to live seems enough for bliss. A lovely old room full of fantastic lights and shadows in the December gloaming. A spacious room lined with books in the most exquisite bindings, for the binding of his books was more to Sir John and the letter press inside. He was very fond of his library. He was very fond of his books. He looked at the bindings and he read the newspapers and magazines which were heaped on a carved oak table at one end of the room. Miss Hauberk sat in a low chair with her feet on the fender, apparently lost in admiration of her Queen Anne shoes. She had lately come in from a long walk on the moor with the useful friend and had changed her clump-soled boots for these pointed toes which set off the high instep that was considered a family mark of the Penlyons. A flat-footed Penlyon would have been thrust out and repudiated by the rest of the clan, perhaps like a sick cow to which the herd gives the coupe de gras. Sir John was standing on the hearth rug with his back to the crackling wood fire, contemplating his books as the fire glow lit up their varied bindings. Mr. Danby was resting luxuriously after his moorland walk, in quite the most comfortable chair in the room, not too near the fire, for Danby was careful of his complexion. At sixty-three years of age, a man who means to be good-looking to the end, 
has to be careful of his complexion. Danby was a slenderly built man of middle height. He had never been handsome, but he had neat, inoffensive features, bright gray eyes, light brown hair, with a touch of silver in it, and perfect hands and feet. He reminded elderly people of that accomplished and amiable gentleman, Charles Matthews the Younger. Miss Hauberk was tall and handsome. She prided herself in the first place upon being every inch a pen lion and in the second place upon being undeniably smart. She belonged to a set which, in the London season, sees a good deal of the royalties, and, like most people who are in touch with personages of the blood royal, she very often talked about them. So much for the actors in the social drama, which was in this very hour to begin at Penlion Castle. The curtain is up, and the first words of the play drop quietly from the lips of Sir John. Christmas again, Danby. I think of all the boring seasons, Christmas is the most boring. My dear uncle, said Adela, that sounds like forgetting what Christmas means. What does Christmas mean to any British householder? Firstly, an extra Sunday wedged into the week, and at my age the longest week is too short, and all the Sundays are too near together. Secondly, an overwhelming shower of stationery in the shape of pamphlets, booklets, circulars, and reports of every imaginable kind a philanthropic scheme for extracting money from the well-to-do classes, schemes so many and so various that a man will harden his heart against the cry of the poor rather than he will take the trouble to consider the multitude of institutions that have been invented to relieve their distress. Thirdly, a servant's hall, which generally sets all the servants by the ears and sometimes sets the house on fire. Fourthly, a cloud of letters from the poor relatives and friends one would willingly forget only to be answered decently with a check. I won't speak of bills, for the so-called Christmas bills are held back till January to embitter the beginning of the year and to remind a man that he was born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Sir John takes up the poker and illustrates this passage of holy writ by striking a tremendous shower of sparks out of a burning pine log. I don't think you need mine, Christmas, said Danby. You are rich enough to satisfy everybody, even the philanthropic gentleman. Or you may plunge for two or three of the best established and soundest charities, hospitals for choice, and give a round sum to each of them. That is what I would do if I were a rich man. And as for festivities, why, you and I are too old, and Miss Hauberk is too sensible to want any fuss of that kind. So we can just put up with the extra Sunday and pull up the arrears of our correspondence between luncheon and dinner while the servants are lingering over their Christmas dessert. That is all very well, said Miss Hauberk. But I think Christmas Day ought to be different from other days somehow. Somehow, yes, but which how? What are we civilized people with plenty of common sense and no silly sentiment? What are we to do year after year in order to lash ourselves into the humor for Christmas mirth and Christmas benevolence? It was all very well for a miserly old churl like Dickens's Scrooge to break out suddenly into kindness and joviality after a long life of avarice. Giving away turkeys and drinking punch were new sensations for him. But for us, who have been giving away turkeys and putting our sovereigns in the plate for nearly fifty Christmas days, you can't expect me to be enthusiastic about Christmas, Adela, any more than you would expect me to hang up my stocking when I go to bed on Christmas Eve. Oh, that stocking! How old I feel when I think of it! How firmly I believe in Santa Claus, and how happy I used to be on Christmas morning when I found pretty things in my stocking or heaped up at the end of my bed. The stocking would not hold a quarter of my presents. I know one year, when we were at Bournemouth, I had a sweet little sketch of a kitten sent by the hereditary princess of Kostroma, who was wintering at the bath for her chest. She had seen me playing in a corner with my kitten a week or two before, when she was taking tea with her mother, don't you know? Sir John said, Stockings, presents, Santa Claus. Ah, there you've hit the mark, Adela. Christmas is a splendid institution in the house, where there are children. Christmas can hardly be made too much of where there are children in question. No, Adela, I am not such a heathen as you think. I have not forgotten the meaning of Christmas. I can still remember that it is a festival kept in reverential memory of a holy child. If you were not your mother's only daughter, and grown up, if somehow or other I had a pack of children belonging to me, I would keep Christmas with the best. Keep it as it ought to be kept, but the Penlions are a vanishing race. I have no children to look to me for gladness. 
Adela Hauberk looks at the fire gravely, thoughtfully, mournfully, and a blush mounts to her fair forehead and slowly fades away. Perhaps she is thinking of a certain young officer in a cavalry regiment to whom she is not actually engaged, but who may someday be her husband if the home authorities are agreeable. And she thinks of a dim, far-off time when she and her husband, and possibly their children, may be Christmasing at Penlyon Castle. The vision seems very remote, almost impossible. Yet, such things have been. Sir John stares at his books resolutely. Danby, who has been dropping asleep in his dusky corner, rouses himself suddenly. Children, yes, of course! Nobody knows how to enjoy Christmas if he has no children to make happy. If one has no children of one's own, one ought to hire some for the Christmas week. Children to cram with mince pies and plum pudding, children to take to the pantomime, children to let off crackers, children to take on the ice. I have any number of godchildren scattered about among the houses of my friends. I feel half a century younger when I am romping with them. What do you think of my notion, Miss Hauberk? Don't you think it would be a good dodge to hire some children for Christmas Day? Your cottages swarm with brats. We should have only to pick and choose. Miss Hauberk said, Cottagers' children generally have colds in their heads. I don't think one could stand cottagers' children for more than an hour or two. I am very fond of children, but I like them to belong to my own class. Danby said, I understand. You want little ladies and gentlemen, with whom you could romp at your ease. I believe even that could be managed. What do you say, Sir John? Shall we hire some children for the Christmas week, just to amuse Miss Hauberk? You may do anything in the world that is idiotic and fantastical, so long as you don't intrude your folly upon me. When you do make a fool of yourself, you generally contrive to do the thing pleasantly. If Adela would like some children playing about the house next week, why, she can ask them, or you can ask them, and as long as they behave decently, I shall not complain. You don't quite grasp my idea, Sir John. This is not to be a question of inviting children. Children out of our own set, spoilt and pampered after the modern fashion. Children who would come as guests and would give themselves airs. No, what I propose is to hire some children. Children of respectable birth and good manners, but whose parents are poor enough to accept the fee which your liberality may offer for the hire of their olive branches. My dear Danby, the notion is preposterous. Except in St. Giles's, where babies are let out to beggars by the day or week, there could be no such people. There is every kind and grade of people, but one must know where to look for them. Do you give me permission to hire two or three? Say three, cleanly, respectable children to assist Miss Hauberk to get through a solitary Christmas in a lonely country house with two old fogies like you and me? Oh, that depends. Where do you propose to find your children? Not in the immediate neighborhood, unless you want to make me the laughing stock of the parish. Amuse yourselves to your heart's content, but I must beg you to leave me uncompromised by your foolishness. Oh, the sheik is getting angry, Mr. Danby. We had better give up your funny idea. Sir John said, No, no, let Danby indulge his fancy. Danby's fancies are always successful, however absurd they may seem to reasonable beings. Danby, throwing his head back upon the chair cushion and laughing his joyous laugh, a laugh that always put other people in good spirits, said, There spoke my noble sheik, the prince of Penlyon, the man with the blood of Cornish kings in his veins. We may have our little bit of reasonable Christmas festivity, Miss Hauberk and I, and you won't mind, but how about the fee for the children? We must pay for our little mummers. We must compensate the parents or parent for the sacrifice of Christmas pleasures. The happy morning faces over the stocking full of toys, the glowing evening faces around the humble fireplace, watching the chestnuts roasting on the bars. You don't know what a little world of joy humble folks lose when they don't have their children about them at Christmas. Confound the fee. Give them 20, 50 pounds if you like. But don't talk to me of poor children. I will have no poor children at Penlyon. Adela is quite right. They have always colds in their heads. They don't know how to treat decent furniture. They would scrape the heavy chairs on the oak floor. They would leave prints of their horrid little thumbs on my books. And though the imprint of the human thumb may be very interesting to the detective physiologist, I am not a student of thumbs and I want to keep my books clean. I am not thinking of poor children in your sense of the word, said Danby. Though I am thinking of people for whom your check of, say, 50 pounds would be a boon. 
Poor relations of your own, I suppose, Danby. Don't be offended. Everybody has poor relations. Dear Princess Romanoff Meskova has often told me how much she has to do for some of her German connections. You've hit it, said Danby. I am thinking of some poor relations. Good. If they have any of your blood, they are sure to be little ladies and gentlemen. Only, forgive me, Danby, poverty is apt to be pushing. I shall write my check for a hundred guineas since the little people belong to you. But don't let this Christmas visit be the thin end of the wedge. Don't let me hear any more of the little dears unless I myself wish it. You shall see them and hear of them no more after old Christmas Day, unless at your own desire. Remember, it is not a visit, it is a transaction. You hire these little creatures for your amusement, our amusement if you like, just as you would hire a conjurer for a juvenile party. You pay them their fee, and you have done with them. That is as it should be. Sir John walks across the room to his desk, lights a candle, and writes his check, payable to Horatio Danby for 100 guineas, while two footmen are bringing in lamps and afternoon tea. Danby said, while folding up the check, Miss Hauberk, did I not rightly call your uncle a prince? Chapter 1 Sir John Penlyon was generally described by his friends as a man of peculiar temper. He was not a bad-tempered man. Indeed, he had a certain princely graciousness which overlooked small offenses. He was not easily made angry. But, on the other hand, when deeply offended, he was vindictive and nursed his wrath from year's end to year's end, refusing ever again to touch the hand of the offender. He had reigned at Penlyon as a lord of the soil ever since he left the university, coming into his own at three and twenty years of age. He had married late, married a very young woman, dowerless, but of good birth, who loved him far better than he ever believed during her lifetime. She died when the younger of her two daughters was only six years old, and it was some years after she had been laid at rest in the family vault of the Penlyons that Sir John found an old diary hidden in a secret drawer at the back of the secretary in his wife's dressing room. A girlish diary, written at intervals, a record of thoughts and feelings rather than of the facts and occupations of daily life. A record which told the widower how fondly he had been beloved, and how many a careless wound he had inflicted upon that tender creature, whose gentle countenance was hidden from his sight forever. The reading of his wife's journal left in Sir John Penlyon's mind the burden of a lasting remorse. He had believed that when the daughter of an impoverished house, his junior by twenty years, had accepted his stately offer of marriage, she had been influenced as much by questions of convenience as he himself had been. He was marrying because the time had come when he ought to marry, unless he wanted to sink into hopeless bachelorhood and loneliness. She was marrying because marriage with a magnate in the land would give her fortune and position. Fixed in this notion of an equality of indifference, he had been studiously polite and kind to his young wife but he had never taken the trouble to sound the depths of that girlish heart. He had taken everything for granted. There had been a domestic disappointment, too, in his married life, calm and undisturbed as it was. Two daughters had been born at Penlyon Castle, but no son. And Sir John Penlyon ardently longed for a son. His chief motive in marrying at over forty years of age was the desire of a son and heir. He was angry at the thought that a distant cousin should ever bear his title and come to reign at Penlyon. The estate was strictly entailed, and that second cousin, a soldier in a line regiment, must needs succeed if Sir John died without leaving a son. The diary reminded him of many sins, reminded him how cold and unloving he had been to those baby daughters. The mother's girlish handwriting had put every little slight on record, not in anger, but in sorrow. The widower came upon such entries as this. I think it must be because he does not care for me that he is so neglectful of Lillian. Everyone says she is a lovely child. It can't be because I am fond of her that I think her so beautiful. The servants all worship her. Mr. Danby adores her, and she adores him. I couldn't help crying the other day. I had to run out of the room or I should have made an absolute fool of myself before my husband. When I saw Mr. Danby playing with her, going on his hands and knees under the billiard table to play at Bo Peep with her, just as if he had been her father, while Sir John was reading his paper at the other end of the room, and only looked up once to complain of the noise. 
Lillian's sweet little silvery laugh, how could he call that a noise? In this, I took Sybil to the library yesterday morning when her father was sitting there alone. It was her birthday, her third birthday, and I thought I might presume upon that. I opened the door a little way and looked in. He was sitting at his desk writing. I ought to have waited till he was disengaged. I whispered to her to go to him and give him a big birthday kiss, and she ran in, toddling across the room in her pretty blue shoes, so busy, so happy, and she cut hold of his arm as he wrote, and lifted herself up on tiptoe and said, Papa, big birthday kiss, in her funny little baby talk. He put down his pen and he stooped down to kiss her. But a moment after, he rang his spring bell two or three times and called out, What is this child doing here, roaming about the house alone? Where is her nurse? He was very kind and polite when he looked around and saw me standing at the door and when I begged his pardon for having disturbed him, but I could see that he was bored and I took Sybil away directly. He met Mr. Danby in the corridor with an armful of toys. What a useful good soul he is and how sorry I shall be when he has left us to go to the Duchess at Edensley. There were many entries of the same nature, womanly regrets recorded again and again. I wonder why he married me. I wonder whether he once loved somebody very dearly and couldn't marry her. I think there must be some reason for his not caring for me. I ought not to complain, even to this stupid old book. But the book is like an old friend. I sit staring at my name and the date written by my old governess at the manor house and recalling those careless, thoughtless days when my sisters and I used to think our Ollendorf exercises the worst troubles we had in this world. Before mother began to be an invalid, before father used to confide all his difficulties to us girls, the debts, the tenants that wouldn't pay, the roofs that wanted new slating. Oh, how long ago it all seems. I have no money troubles now. Father has had legacies, and everything is going smoothly at home. And yet, I feel sometimes as if my heart were slowly turning to ice. Break, thou deep vase of chilling tears, that time has shaken into frost. Sir John Penlyon never forgot the reading of that diary. He remembered the very day and hour when looking for a missing list of family jewels, jewels which his dead wife had worn on state occasions, and which were to go back to the bank and to lie in darkness, like her who had worn them. He had come upon that old German copy book, rolled up and thrust far back in the secret drawer, tied with a shabby old ribbon. He remembered sitting by the tireless hearth in the prettily furnished dressing room, disused since his wife's death. He remembered the dull gray autumn sky and the rain drifting across the leaden sky, and the shags standing on the rocks, drenched and drooping all nature in low spirits. The reading of that record of unhappiness, so meekly born, was not without one good result. Sir John took more notice of his two girls than he had ever done in their mother's lifetime. Sybil, the younger, contrived more particularly to find her way into his heart. She was stronger and more vivacious than her elder sister. She was full of daring, a romp, and a tomboy. Lillian was like her mother and was gentle and shrinking and subdued as her mother had been in the presence of the husband she loved and feared. Sybil had a nature unacquainted with fear, and her father fancied he saw in her all the highest qualities of the Penn Lions, beauty, strength, and courage. If she had been but a boy, he sometimes said to himself with a profound sigh. It seemed a hard thing that such a splendid creature must needs be cheated out of the heritage of her father and grandfather, and of many generations before them, only because she happened to be a daughter instead of a son. The Penlyon estate had been growing in wealth and importance while all those generations of the past were growing from youth to age. Through life to death, the Penlyons had developed a great mining district, far off yonder southward towards Truro. They had added farm to farm between Bowcastle and Bodmin. Everything had prospered from this proud and ancient race, and from Launceston to Tintagel, and Tintagel to Bude, there was no such family as the Penlyons of Penlyon Castle. Sir John was foolishly indulgent to his motherless daughters during the first four or five years of his widowhood, making amends to them for all that had been wanting in his conduct to their mother. His remorse was not for sins of commission, but for sins of omission. He knew that he had not been unkind to his wife. He had only failed to understand her. 
The poor little diary in the German exercise book had told him how dearly he had been beloved and how dull and ungrateful he had been. For nearly five years after his wife's death, Sir John lived at Penlyon Castle, managed his estates, hunted and shot, and in summer did a little yachting along that wild north coast and southward by Penzance and Falmouth, and as far as the start point. In all those five years, he had his two children much about him, took them on his yacht, taught them to ride, and was enraptured with the pluck and endurance shown by the younger, whether on sea or land. She rode a pony that her elder sister dared not mount. Her father took her with him when he went out with the harriers, and she rode up and down those wild hills with a dash and cleverness that enchanted the squires and farmers of the district. During all this time, the girls were in a manner running wild. They had a nursery governess to look after them, whose authority was of the smallest, and who soon came to understand that Sir John Penlyon's daughters were to do as they liked, and that loth learning and elegant accomplishments counted for very little at Penlyon Castle. Look after their health, Miss Peterson, and see that they change their shoes when they come in from walking, said Sir John. All the rest is leather and prunella. Miss Peterson, who had never read Pope, took this for an allusion to the shoes. The two girls would have got the better of their governess in any case. But Sir John being avowedly on the side of ignorance, the poor young lady had no chance of making them take kindly to education. They loved the gardens and the hills and the wild sea bench and those narrow walks which looked to Miss Peterson like mere ledges on the face of the cliff and where she could hardly stand for a minute without feeling giddy. They were strong and bold and free in every movement of their young limbs, while she was London-bred, a weakling, and a very bad walker. Her feet used to ache on those grand moorland roads, and her poor sick soul longed for a royal blue or any other friendly omnibus to take her in and carry her homewards. She was one of those people who say they are very fond of the country in summer. The breezy October days, the white mists of winter, filled her with sadness and dejection. The two little girls were kind to her after their free and easy fashion, but they treated her with a good-natured contempt. She was afraid of a horse. She was afraid of the sea. She was afraid of being blown off the cliff when the wind was high, and she could not walk two miles without feeling tired. She confessed to being troubled with corns. Miss Peterson has corns, cried Sybil. Isn't it funny? I thought it was only old people who had corns. This free and easy life went on for five years. The children throve and grew apace, did what they liked, ate what they liked, and were as idle as they liked. The effect of this indulgence upon their physical health was all that the fondest father could desire. The doctor from Bowcastle complained laughingly that the Penn Lion nursery wasn't worth a five pound note to him from year's end to year's end. You never have anything the matter with you, he said as the children skipped round him in the road, fond of him in their small way, as one of the funny personages of the district. I don't believe I have earned seven and sixpence out of either of you since I lanced your gums. Did you lance my gums? cried Sybil. How funny. You didn't think it funny then, I can tell you, said the doctor, grimly. Didn't I? What's it like? Lance them now, said Sybil, curling up her red lips and opening her mouth very wide. No, thank you. You'd bite. You look as if you could bite, laughed the doctor. I tell you what it is. I believe Miss Peterson is a witch. One of our ancient Cornish witches who has turned herself into a nice looking young woman. Mr. Nichols could not so far perjure himself as to say pretty. Miss Peterson has bewitched you both. She has charmed away the measles and the whooping cough. She has cheated me out of my just rights. Miss Peterson heard him with a pale smile, shifting her weight from the more painful foot to the foot that pained her a little less. The children went leaping and bounding along the road, the embodiment of healthy, high-spirited childhood. Sir John praised Miss Peterson for her care of them and rewarded her, as the school board mistresses are rewarded, according to results. Only the results in this case were physical and not mental, and Sir John's Christmas present of a silk gown or a ten-pound note was given because his daughters were healthy and happy, rather than because they made any progress with their education. In sober truth, they knew a little less than the village children of the same age at the parish school. At the end of those five years, that pleasant life came to an abrupt close. 
North Cornwall found out all at once that it could not continue to prosper and to hold its own in the March of Progress unless it were represented by Sir John Penlyon. Radical influences were abroad in the land. The church was in danger and was indeed being fast pushed to the wall by the force of dissent, its superior and numerical strength. North Cornwall must no longer be given over to the radical party. It was time that a stand should be made and a battle should be fought. Sir John Penlyon, said the newspapers, was the man to make that stand and to fight that battle. He was rich, he had a stake in the country, he was influential, he was fairly popular. He had sat in Parliament 14 years before for a Cornish borough that was now among the things of the past, a sop long since flung by conservative reformers to the democratic Sibiris. He could never sit for Blackmount, the hereditary seat of his ancestors, with a constituency of three and twenty, but he could sit for North Cornwall, and North Cornwall claimed him for its own. Perhaps Sir John Penlyon was getting tired of rusticity. In any case, he consented to be nominated in the conservative interest. And the result of the contest was a triumph for the good old family and the good old cause. Sir John took a small house in Queen Anne's Gate, gave himself up to politics, and almost deserted his Cornish domain. Except for a month or six weeks in the autumn, he was scarcely seen in the West during the seven years that followed his election as member for the Western Division of North Cornwall. He was re-elected during those seven years without opposition, for it was now felt that the Western Division had become a pocket borough of the Penlyons, just as Blackmount had been. There was no use in fighting Sir John Penlyon in his stronghold of the West. Before settling himself in his comfortable bachelor quarters by St. James's Park, Sir John invited his only sister, Mrs. Hauberk, to Penlyon Place, with a view to take counsel with her as to the education of his daughters. The time had doubtless come when Lillian and Sybil must cease to run wild. Mrs. Hauberk's husband was the younger son of a peer, and she gave herself some airs on the strength of that connection. She was very fond of talking of Allerton, the family seat, where she usually spent a somewhat dismal six weeks in September and October, while her husband was going about the country speaking at political meetings and wearing himself out, as he declared, in support of the cause. Mrs. Hauberk came. She had not seen her nieces since their mother's death. She took them in hand at once in a masterful way. And after spending a single afternoon with them and their governess, she informed her brother that his children were monsters of ignorance. The sooner you get rid of that young woman, the better, she said of poor Miss Peterson, who had done all in her power to make herself agreeable to the great lady. She has taught them nothing and she has not the slightest authority over them. She has looked after their health replied Sir John, apologizing for the governess's shortcomings, and they are very fond of her. One wouldn't wish them to be fond of her. It is a very bad sign when children are fond of their governess. It means that she spoils them and allows them to be idle. They have been idle at my desire. I told Miss Peterson to cultivate their bodies and leave their minds alone. And she has obeyed you to the letter. I never met with such ignorant children. They pretend to be fond of flowers, yet they know no more of botany than my maid Rogers. They have made no progress with the piano. They know no French. They are backward in everything. They are splendid children, said Sir John doggedly. No doubt. And if you allow them to grow up with Miss Peterson, they will be splendid savages. And you will be put to shame by them when they go into society. It does not do for girls to be ignorant and unaccomplished nowadays. You will want them to marry well, I suppose, by and by. Well, I shan't want them to marry badly. Of course not. And to make good matches, they will have to be accomplished as well as good looking. They are very sweet girls, added Mrs. Hauberg, not wishing to offend her only brother and a wealthy brother. But they have been dreadfully indulged. I wanted them to be happy. No doubt they have had a fine time of it. You were not so weak about them in their poor mother's time. No, I wish I had been a little weaker. How do you mean? I think Mary would have liked me to take more notice of them. Nonsense, John. You were perfect in your conduct to poor Mary. No young woman could have had a more chivalrous husband. I hope you don't reproach yourself for having been wanting in any respect towards poor Mary. Well, we needn't talk about that. Nobody can mend the past. I want you to do what is best for the girls now I am to be so much in London. 
If Miss Peterson is not governess enough for them, she must have a superior person to help her. She can stay to look after their health and see that they change their shoes. My dear John, a maid will do all that. If you want me to be of use to them, you must let me have a free hand. Certainly, you shall have a free hand for the next five years, till they have finished their education. Lillian is nearly thirteen. Five years hence, she will be old enough to enter society. And it shall be my care that she is fitted for her position as your eldest daughter, said Mrs. Hoburg decisively. Chapter 2 Sir John went to London and left Mrs. Hoburg mistress of the field. She began her work of reform by dismissing meek little Miss Peterson, who was so much afraid of her that she was almost glad to go. Yes, even to exchange the flesh pots of Penlyon Castle for the meager fare of a lodging in Camden Town. Miss Peterson loved her pupils and wept at parting from them, but the scornful domination of the fashionable lady had cowed her spirits. She cried bitterly on the last morning at the castle, but found few words to express either her love or her sorrow. Sybil, the impulsive one, clung round Miss Peterson's neck and abused her aunt for sending this faithful friend away. I shall hate the new governess, and I shall always love you, she said. My dear, you mustn't hate anyone. We have been very happy together, and I hope some day Sir John will let me see you and Lillian again. Let you see us, exclaimed Sybil. I should think so indeed. You shall come and live with me again the minute I am grown up. She will have no power over us then. She was Mrs. Hauberg, who had not left her room at this early hour. The carriage was at the door to take Miss Peterson to the coach, and the coach was to take her to the station at Launceston, where it would be a long, long journey to Camden Town. Lillian and Sybil had packed a picnic basket for her with provisions that would have lasted for a week if the train had been snowed up on the moorland above Oakhampton. "'I'll go to Victoria with you!' cried Sybil. Victoria was the point where the coach stopped to pick up passengers from Penlyon. No, no, my darling, your aunt wouldn't like. But Sybil jumped into the carriage before the sentence was finished. The footman shut the door and the coachman drove off. There was no time to spare if the coach was to swallow up poor little Miss Peterson that morning. The coach did swallow her, and Sybil, without either hat or jacket, alighted from the brougham half an hour afterward to find her aunt standing in the porch awaiting her return. "'You are the most undisciplined child I have ever had to do with,' said Miss Hauberg. The new governess arrived three days after Miss Peterson's departure. She too was young in years, but she was old in culture and accomplishments. She was a model governess. She had taken prizes and certificates and had passed examinations of all kinds. She was strong in mathematics and in natural science. She knew a respectable amount of Latin and had a useful smattering of Greek enough to make her oppressively erudite about the derivation of words. Sybil and Lillian began by hating her, and though hatred soon simmered down to toleration, they never became fond of her. She had indifferent health and suffered from neuralgic headaches, and indeed it seemed as if she introduced headaches into Penlyon Place, for her pupils very soon began to suffer from aching temples, and to look dark and heavy about the eyes and to lose those fine appetites for indiscriminate food which they had enjoyed under the Peterson regime. In the old happy time when they used to go down to dessert every evening and sit on each side of their father, and eat as much fruit and cake, chow chow, guava jelly, and preserved pineapple as ever they liked, while Sir John nibbled an olive or two and sipped his claret. Neuralgia and headache reigned at Penlyon, and the two girls grew white and wan like their all-accomplished governess and Mr. Nichols, the family doctor, had no longer to complain of the rude health of the Miss Penlyons. He had plenty of visits booked against Penlyon Place at the end of the year. Just at the time when Lillian and Sybil were growing fast, running up from stout chubby children into thin slips of girls, just when their constitutions most needed rest and liberty and pleasant exercise in the open air, riding, tennis, walking, rowing, romping, this burden of education was laid upon them. They were reminded every day that they had been neglected and that they were to make amends for lost time by extra application. They were crammed with ologies from which not one young woman 
out of a hundred ever derives the faintest pleasure or advantage in afterlife. They were made to sit at the piano, tap, tap, tapping the notes first with one finger and then with another in monotonous five finger exercises. The athletics of piano practice, Miss Gambert called this heart sickening drudgery. Even the music they played as a relief from the five finger tapping was of a dry and learned order which aroused no interest in their minds. A sad mechanic exercise and no more. Their only pleasure at the piano was found in stolen minutes when Miss Gambert was out of earshot, when Sybil, whose ear was of the quickest, picked out music hall tunes which she had heard gardeners or stable boys whistling at their work. Music hall ditties that catch the fancy of city and suburbs will travel even as far west as Tintagel. Mr. Nichols remonstrated with the governess upon the subject of overmuch study, and had even the audacity to argue the point with Mrs. Hauberk herself. That lady laughed his arguments to scorn. We have gone beyond that old-fashioned idea of brain work being bad for the Constitution, my good Mr. Nichols. Look at judges, bishops, famous physicians, some of the longest-lived men on record. My nieces are like all girls of their age, fanciful and rather affected. Miss Gambert is giving them a second and solid education, which will make them valuable members of society. And here you come with your old-fashioned fads about overwork and mental strain. I can only tell you, madam, that these dear young ladies have deteriorated in health since Miss Peterson left. Miss Peterson, she was a favorite of yours, evidently, doctor, interrupted Mrs. Hauberk with a sneer which brought an indignant blush to the cheeks and forehead of the bachelor doctor, who had never given Miss Peterson so much as a thought in the way of gallantry. Come, Mr. Nichols, in spite of your worship of ignorance, I think you will admit that any deterioration in my nieces is the effect of overgrowth, and that it is natural for girls of their age to be weak and weedy. Yes, Mrs. Hauberk, and that weak and weedy age is just the period at which the educational strain should be relaxed. However, I can but submit to your superior wisdom and hope that with the help of tonics and a strengthening diet, the young ladies may regain the ground lost in the last year or so. Give them as many tonics as you like, only don't interfere with the cultivation of their minds. Mrs. Hauberk took her own way in this and in every other matter in which she was given what she called a free hand. She had an invincible belief in her own wisdom and in the foolishness of almost everybody else. She drove Miss Gamber, and Miss Gamber drove her pupils, and Lillian Penlyon, at 18 years of age, was certainly a very well-read and accomplished young woman. Only it was a pity that she should be so weak and weedy and consumptive-looking. Her poor mother's constitution, Mrs. Hauberk said decisively, when Sir John lamented his daughter's delicate health. Lillian made her debut in society, chaperoned by her aunt from a fine house in the best part of Cromwell Road, while Sybil stayed at Penlyon and went on grinding at the dry-as-dust books and the learned German music, which the most advanced educational authorities had prescribed for the cultivation of youthful minds. Lillian went everywhere and was admired for her delicate beauty and the shy dignity of her manners and her unlikeliness to other girls. She had grown up in solitude, and the slang of other girls was a language unknown to her, and the ways of other girls were foreign to her mind. She was very much admired for these superior qualities, and it was not forgotten that she was joint heiress of Sir John Penlyon, the wealthy Cornishman, whose mines and slate quarries were known to yield a large revenue, without counting his extensive landed estate, the greater part of which unhappily was included in the entail, and would go to the heir at law. Before Lillian had been out three months, Mrs. Hauberk had the triumph of informing her brother that Lord Lurgrave, the Earl of Holmesley's son, had proposed to his elder daughter, and only waited his permission to consider himself formally engaged to her. "'Does Lillian like the young man?' Sir John asked briefly. "'I believe it is quite a romantic attachment on both sides.' "'Then let them marry,' said Sir John. "'The sooner the better.' He did everything in his power to facilitate the marriage." The young man was a good young man, nobody had any charge to bring against him, and his father, Lord Holmesley, was well placed in the world and stood well with the world. 
The alliance was altogether honorable, and Miss Penlyon was thought to have done well for herself in her first season. Sir John had his own reasons for hurrying on the marriage, reasons which he told to nobody. More than once during the years of his widowhood, he had been on the point of taking a second wife, and at the eleventh hour, on the eve of proposing to a lady whom he thought inclined to favor his suit, had drawn back. No, he had married once without love, and he had not made his wife happy. He would not enter upon a second loveless union in the hope of an heir to his estate. Long ago, in his early manhood, he had loved, and he had been balked in his love, which had been bestowed upon one who was his inferior in birth and social status. He had loved a farmer's daughter, and had wanted to make her his wife, setting all social distinctions at naught for her dear sake. But he had given her up at his father's bidding, and at her own entreaty. She loved him too well to make bad blood between father and son. All this had happened nearly forty years ago, but it had influenced the whole of Sir John Penlyon's afterlife. He made up his mind that there should be no second loveless union for him, and he looked forward to seeing his grandchildren grow up about him. He could not give Penlyon place or the lands of Penlyon to his daughter's son. Those must go to the heir at law, but he might bequeath the accumulations of long years and the quarries and mines which he himself had bought. He had never spent more than a third of his income. When he went down to the west in October, he found Mrs. Hauberk established there before him, superintending all the domestic arrangements for the marriage. The wedding clothes were being made in London. All that Sir John had to do was to agree with Lord Holmesley's lawyers about the settlement. The wedding was fixed for the 15th of November. The settlement was liberal, but if Sir John Penlyon's daughter was to die childless, her fortune would revert to her father, and young Lord Lurgrave would have nothing. This point was insisted upon by Sir John's lawyer. Happily, the young lady's death is a remote contingency, said Lord Holmesley, when his own lawyer objected to the clause. Sir John found the lovers very happy, and Penlyon placed in a pleasant bustle of expectation. He found Sybil still grinding on at science and history, and more ologies than he himself had ever heard of, a university education in his day not having recognized the ologies. He found her pale and thin and disguised in smoke-colored spectacles, which she had taken to wearing because the light hurt her eyes. "'My poor pretty Sybil, how they have changed you!' exclaimed Sir John. His younger daughter, once so daring in her movement, so frankly demonstrative in her affection, was now shy and restrained in her manner to her father. He had seen a good deal of Lillian in the London season, and the ice had been broken between them. Lillian was almost a Lillian of old, but Sybil was completely changed. And though Mrs. Hauberk assured him that the change was an improvement, he could not help regretting the old Sybil, the frank and fearless companion, the spirited young horsewoman, the sunburnt, bronze-haired girl who could handle oar or boat hook with the best of the lads of Bocastle. He saw her at her studies in the library every morning. He heard her play erudite German music after dinner in the drawing room. He saw her and Miss Gambert settling out every afternoon for their constitutional walk on the moors. And riding home in the dusk one evening, he saw them pacing the wind-blown road with Mr. Moreland, the high church curate, in attendance. He questioned Sybil about the curate when she had played her newest mazurka and was bidding him good night. Is there anything between Miss Gambert and Moreland? He asked. Is he paying his addresses to her? No, father, I think not. Hmm. I began to suspect something when I saw him walking with you two this afternoon. He is a very good fellow, though his father is only a grocer in a small way of business in Plymouth. She might do worse. Yes, he is very good. That was all. Sybil touched her father's cheek with a faint fluttering kiss and retired. Leaving the room in the quiet manner which Miss Gambert had impressed upon her as the proper manner for a young lady belonging to one of the county families. Miss Penlyon's wedding was a very smart wedding, or as smart as a wedding can be in the wilds of Cornwall. She had a bishop to marry her, assisted by a high church archdeacon, and by Mr. Moreland, curate of the parish. Mr. Moreland, who was a pale, thin young man with large blue eyes and a short, nervous cough, 
and who was nearer Rome in all his thoughts and aspirations than the archdeacon. Lillian Penlyon was as graceful and dignified a bride as anyone could desire to see, and Miss Hauberk prided herself upon the result of her wise administration. I hope you are satisfied with your daughters today, John, she said, swelling with conscious merit, her matronly form seeming larger than usual in the amplitude of a brand new velvet gown. They are looking very handsome, but I wish they did not look so fragile, replied Sir John gravely. Blood, my dear John, blood. You wouldn't expect a racer to show the bulk and bone of a cart horse. When the wedding was over and Lillian and her husband were traveling in Italy on a wedding tour, which was to last till the spring, Life at Penlion Castle dropped back into the old grooves, and the old grooves meant books and piano and drawing board, varied only by the dull constitutional walk or the duller drive. The winter skies in that western land were clear and bright, and a few stray flowers lingered here and there in the shelter of the hills, as if winter had forgotten them. But the landscape, in all its poetic beauty, had a melancholy landscape for the afternoon eyes of a girl whose long, laborious mornings were given to dry books and drier music, and to convince herself with strenuous toil that she had no talent for painting. The daily walk was insisted upon by doctors and governess, so Miss Penlyon was marched out in fair weather or foul, and had to tramp submissively for at least four miles, sometimes buffeted by the wind in the spray, sometimes moving ghost-like in a gray mist of rain. Mr. Moreland, the curate, often joined governess and pupil in these afternoon walks. He had nothing to say about the world of men, but he had lived and had his being from boyhood upwards in a little world of books, and about these he was eloquent. Carlyle, Emerson, Hawthorne, Longfellow, Shelley, Keats, these were his gods, and he would quote them and talk of them for an hour at a stretch. To Sybil, who had been reared upon hard facts strictly on the grad grind principle, the world of philosophy and poetry was a revelation. She explored her father's library, and in a corner among the very refuse of the shelves found a shabby old volume of Shelley, printed in Paris, and this treasure she carried off to her bedroom and kept under her pillow and poured over in secret, making his favorite passages and learning them by rote, so that one day, half unconsciously, she took upon the line where Mr. Moreland stopped and went on to the end of the stanza. I hope you found those lines in a book of selections, said Miss Gambert. I am sure your aunt would disapprove of Shelley. She may disapprove, but I am sure she never read them, answered Sybil. Lillian told me that she never reads anything but the tradesmen's books, and that she pours over them every Tuesday morning in a maddening manner, and that she has awful talks with her housekeeper. Mrs. Hauberk is a very clever woman and an admirable manager. I dare say she is but she needs not parade her butcher's book. She has a pile of horrid tradesmen's books on the breakfast table and looks over them as she eats her breakfast. I call it absolutely indecent. Lillian said it made her hate Tuesday mornings. She used to wonder if Aunt thought she made too much difference in the weekly bills. Mrs. Hauberk has ample means and keeps a liberal table, but she abhors waste as all sensible women do, said the governess reprovingly. If she parades her butcher's book when I am in the Cromwell Road, I shall say something rude to her, retorted Sybil, but I hope Lillian will be in town in the spring, and then she will be able to chaperone me. You are looking forward eagerly to the spring when you will have left Cornwall, said Mr. Moreland, pensively, and then there came a silence upon Sybil and the curate, and Miss Gambert did all the talking during the homeward walk. Sir John Penlyon went back to London soon after Christmas and politics claimed him for their own. He had arranged with his sister that Sybil was to make her debut from the Cromwell Road as Lillian had done. Lady Lurgrave, even if she were to have a house in town, which was doubtful, would be too young and inexperienced a matron to take charge of her sister. She would not have the firmness of will needed to keep younger sons at bay. She would be too good-natured and easy in her treatment of detrimentals. Altogether, Sir John felt that his sister would be the only competent chaperone for Sybil, whom he always thought of as wild and difficult to manage, remembering how rash and willful she had been in those childish years, when she rode the piebald pony and insisted upon going faster at ditches and hedges than her father thought safe for so juvenile a performer. She had been headstrong and disobedient in those days, but he had loved her for her high spirits and daring. 
Now on the threshold of womanhood, she was obedient enough to please the most exacting parent. Mrs. Hauberk and Miss Gambert, between them, had succeeded in taming her. But perhaps Sir John hardly liked this younger daughter of his quite so well after that careful training as he had liked her in her childhood, when she had been as wild and sweet as a dog rose and as full of thorns. Mrs. Hauberk, however, took credit to herself for having produced the most perfect thing in young ladies, and Sir John felt that he ought to be grateful. He really did feel grateful to this clever sister of his for having taken all his paternal responsibilities off his shoulders and left him free to attend to the affairs of the nation. Very grateful until one foggy afternoon in February when a telegram was brought to him in the library at the Carlton where he was writing his letters. To Sir John Penlyon, Sybil left the castle at seven this morning. She has been traced as far as Bodmin Road Station supposed to have gone to Bristol. I am in the greatest distress of mind. Pray tell me what I am to do, Gambert. What does the woman mean? Sir John asked himself, staring at the words in the telegram. Sybil must have quarreled with her and is on her way to London, meaning no doubt to come to her aunt or to me. Bristol is all nonsense, a mistake of the porters or of the servant who followed her to Bodmin, a foolish troublesome business, just now too, with this amendment coming on tonight, when I am so full of work. He looked at his watch, half past two. The train from Bodmin would arrive at Paddington soon after four. He must be on the platform, of course, to receive this foolish daughter. It was very wrong of her, a vein of the old Adam cropping up in the regenerate Sybil. Who would have thought her capable of such rebellion? She seemed so tame and well broken when I was at Penlyon, mused Sir John, but no doubt that middle-aged young lady with the spectacles and the scraggy shoulders is rather a trying person to live with in a country house through a long winter. He went on writing his letters till there was only just time to get to Paddington, allowing a whitish margin for the fog, before the fast train from the far west came in, if the train also had not been delayed by the fog. Sir John would not have been there to see its arrival. He was there, walking up and down the platform, watchful and on the alert, until the last cab had driven away with the last passenger and the last portmanteau, but among all those passengers there was no daughter of his. I am a fool, he said to himself. She may have got out at Westbourne Park. He took another cab and had himself driven slowly through the thickening fog across the park to South Kensington, and the fine large house in the Cromwell Road from which Sybil was to take a header into London society. Mrs. Hauberk was sitting alone in the subdued lamplight of the back drawing room, the spacious front drawing room a yawning gulf of shadows lighted only by occasional gleams from a low fire. She started from her chair as Sir John was announced, and ran to him and fell upon his neck, sobbing. "'Oh, my dear, dear John, I am so sorry for you!' she exclaimed, gaspingly. "'What do you mean, Clara? What has happened? Has Sybil come to you?' Come to me, poor, blind, deluded girl, come to me. Oh, John, haven't you heard? Didn't you receive poor Miss Gambert's second telegram? No, cried Sir John fiercely. What does it all mean? Has there been an accident on the line? Is the girl hurt? Killed? He asked, hoarse with sudden terror. His sister's tears, her agitation, her embraces were enough to suggest direst calamity. Killed, cried Mrs. Hauberg. No, she is safe enough. There are some parents, perhaps, who would rather hear that she had been killed in a railway accident than that she had so lowered herself, thrown herself away so blindly as she has done. Clara, if you would be good enough to tell me in plain words what has happened to my daughter, instead of trying to act like Madame Restori in Medea, you would do me a favor, said Sir John in his most unpleasant voice. Miss Hauberk sat down and collected herself, thinking, as she did so, that it was in the fraternal nature to be disagreeable at every stage of life. She remembered dimly how shamefully her brother had ill-treated her favorite doll five and forty years before. He was the same man now. Now, after she had toiled and slaved for him, saving him all thought and care about his motherless girls, the same man, utterly heartless and unfeeling. Your daughter Sybil was married to Mr. Moreland, the curate at St. Sophia's Church, Plymouth, this morning she said with haughty indifference. If you haven't received your own telegram, you may like to see mine. She waved her hand towards an occasional table, on which lay an open telegram. Sir John snatched it up and read it eagerly, 
stooping to get the light of the shaded lamp, which was intended to make darkness visible rather than to illuminate the room. The inquiries about Bristol were only a blind. She went to Plymouth with Mr. Morey, and they were married at St. Sophia's and have gone to Torquay for their honeymoon. A telegram from him to me, letter to follow. Also, letter to Sir John. I think you must feel for me, dear friend, for you alone can understand my feelings under this cruel blow. It was a long telegram. A woman must be deeply moved before she can be so reckless in the expenditure of words, every one of which has to be paid for. Her feelings, growled Sir John. What have her feelings to do with my daughter's misconduct, except so far as she has proved herself unworthy of being trusted with the care of a pupil? Oh, Sir John, don't you know the poor thing was engaged to Moreland? He pretended to be only waiting for his first living in order to marry her. Oh, that was the state of the case, was it? said Sir John, with cutting coolness. And he thought it a better speculation to marry my daughter? I am very sorry for him. He will find he has made a bad bargain. He would have done better to marry the governess, for she is a breadwinner, and my daughter will never bring him a sixpence. Oh, John, she has been very foolish, poor child. But I know you will forgive her after a time. Not after an eternity. If eternity could have an afterward. She has set me at naught, and from this hour to my last hour on earth I shall set her at naught. It shall be to me as if she had never existed. Well, what a dramatic place we find ourselves ending on the first part of The Christmas Hirelings by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. I will see you on Monday with another episode of A Cozy Christmas Podcast, and then next Friday will be part two, chapters three and four of The Christmas Hirelings. So I hope to see you then, and in the meantime, be kind and do good, and have a very Merry Christmas. <laughs>